Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate that kind introduction. As someone who's gotten used to the introduction of will the defendant please rise, it's, uh, it's gratifying to hear anything but will the defendant please rise. Uh, I'm uh, Jack Abramoff. I used to be a lobbyist. I'm a recovering lobbyist, recovering Republican lobbyist, and I think uh, based on what I've been hearing tonight, recovering from both of those might be a good idea, at least as far as, uh, as, far as this crowd goes. I'm not sure I'm able to recover from the first, but certainly trying to recover from the second. I uh, got involved in politics at uh, my college, Brandeis University. I saw Ms. Hefner here, an alumni as well, alum of, uh, rather alum of Brandeis. Brandeis was a very left-wing college. Uh, Brandeis, when I arrived, I was assigned Angela Davis's dorm room. Angela Davis, if you remember, was the uh, perennial Communist Party USA vice presidential candidate. So I thought, I guess they assigned me the dorm room of Angela Davis, so I went in, performed an exorcism, cleaned up, and um, went to work. Brandeis was not a necessarily hospitable place for Republicans, but I got involved in college Republicans there. Then later connected with uh, another fellow who went on to uh, national fame, perhaps not as much notoriety as I, or maybe, depending on when I send his, say his name, we'll see, named Grover Norquist, who was at, uh, who was at Harvard uh, Business School at the time. And we came to Washington, and I got involved in college Republicans there. I was a national chairman, and then headed President Reagan's grassroots lobby. And there encountered uh, the corruption for the first time, or at least noticed the corruption that was going on there when I got involved uh, in lobbying for the Amex missile and was involved in helping to trade votes with the man I worked with whose name was Pat Buchanan. I know this is a litany of uh, heroes of this audience uh, that I'm saying. I'll try to get to uh, more uh, friendly faces in a moment. After I was done that, I went out and became a movie producer. I figured if Reagan uh, could go from movies to politics, I could go from politics to movies, but unfortunately, my movies weren't as good as Ronald Reagan's movies were. As you can imagine, they were quite feckless. They were action movies starring such luminaries and such thespians as Dolph Lundgren and other action stars. After about 10 years, I returned to Washington and became a lobbyist. Now, you wonder why would anybody go from being a movie producer to being a lobbyist? Why would anybody go from anything, frankly, to being a lobbyist? In fact, when I was asked to join a lobbying firm, it was a firm based in Seattle, my response was, why should I join the profession that's responsible for destroying our country? And that was my response, and I turned to the fellow who asked me, who was my across-the-street neighbor, who was a good friend of mine. I thought he was only a lawyer, I didn't realize, when I said, well, why would I want to be a lobbyist? Aren't they the bloodsuckers that are destroying our country? And he said, well, Jack, I'm a lobbyist too. I said, well, uh, of course not you, but everyone else. I became a lobbyist. I built a practice over 10 years, and during that period, I built a rather large practice. But also during that, those years, unfortunately, the ethos of that world and of my own, uh, to win, to not necessarily pay attention to the means, get to the ends, and to engage roughly at times, unfortunately, in the political process on both sides, we had Republicans, we had Democrats, gave me a view of the world that I thought was just fine, unfortunately for me. Well, one day that world ended. One day I woke up a Sunday morning, not to watch David on Meet the Press, but rather to read in the Washington Post a rather devastating article, a devastating critique of my practice, of the work that I had been doing, the work that I thought being in the bubble in Washington, being immersed in that world, I thought was just fine. I didn't think what's wrong, what's unusual about this. And I started reading about it, and frankly, the first reaction of the people who were with me and of me was, well, all right, big deal. What's the big deal? It's 2004, there's a presidential election, everybody's got ADD. Nobody will remember this. Come tomorrow, we'll wrap it in fish, and on we go. Well, that's not quite what happened. There were more articles almost daily on the front page of the Post. My uh, uh, friend, Senator McCain, <laughs> subpoenaed all of my emails. These emails were then given to the Washington Post. And you know, as you grow up, you're told, don't write anything in an email or a letter in the old days, a fax, if you folks remember what faxes were. 
don't write anything in an email you don't want to read on the front page of the Washington Post. Well, everything I wrote that was terrible was written, was put on the front page of the Washington Post, unfortunately. And day after day, I was watching this. And I started out, again, with the, well, this will blow over. This is not new. This is a scandal in Washington. Big deal. Who cares? Well, that was the reaction for the first few weeks. Then I shifted quickly to the next uh, mode that people in those situations get into. And by the way, that virtually everybody in the prison I spent far too many years in stayed in, which is denial which is why they picking on me. What's wrong with me? I mean, all right, so lobbyists, uh, you know, they don't like lobbyists. Why me? I didn't invent anything. I didn't innovate. Lobbyists buy tickets uh, for congressmen to go see sporting events. Uh, lobbyists will buy six tickets. So I had 72 tickets. What's the big deal? Lobbyists take congressmen to play golf. So instead of taking them over to Congressional Country Club, I put them on a G4 and flew them over to Scotland to play golf. What's the difference? This kind of denial, unfortunately for me, was the tone of the day. And for a while, I was trying to wonder, why am I getting picked on? And one day, thank God, I had a different moment. And after seeing the media crowded outside my house day in and day out, every time I went to Washington, uh, being stared at by everybody, hearing my name being made into a punchline on every late night talk show, being thanked by George Clooney in a hostile fashion at the uh, uh, award show. Everywhere I went, finally I said, you know, maybe they're all not wrong, and maybe I'm not all right. Maybe what I was doing is not right. Maybe everything I believed I was doing is not necessarily good for me, or ultimately for the country. And I made a, I made a decision to start rereading my emails from the past, those emails that were subpoenaed. Now, there were a million emails I had sent during the period of time I was a lobbyist. Now, some folks in the audience probably are saying, wow, a million emails. I speak at a lot of colleges, and of course, the reaction when I say a million emails, virtually all the time, they say, big deal, I sent that many IMs last night. You know, what's a million emails? Well. It was a lot of emails, and I started reading them, and I started looking back in detail in the things that I was involved in 10 years ago. Well, I don't know how many of you looked at your emails from 10 years ago, but once you get through the whole grammar and uh, spelling and uh, everything else, I didn't think I had a good spell check, I guess, in those days, you start to get a little worried, and I got a little worried. You know, really, I unfortunately wasn't the saint I had hoped to be when I grew up. I wasn't necessarily the devil that I was being portrayed. You know, it got a little out of hand. Some of the papers, in fact, papers in uh, Louisiana were blaming me for Hurricane Katrina. Now, I was a, a good lobbyist probably, but I wasn't that good a lobbyist, you know, to bring on a hurricane. They were blaming me for taking money from uh, moving it from the levees or the, uh, to the clients and all sorts of things. And I started rereading the emails and I started rethinking my involvement in politics, my involvement in lobbying, my involvement, period. And I came quickly, unfortunately, to a conclusion that I had made mistakes. I'd done things that were wrong. I didn't necessarily start out to do it, but I did it. And that, therefore, instead of fighting and making a big show of it, I was going to be quiet and try to do what I could to make recompense and start working to get through this. But something else happened in that process, and that's probably the reason I'm here tonight. During my reanalysis of myself, I also looked at our system. The system, by the way, that I and many people inside the Beltway defend to the death and feel is completely functional and, complete, and feel is completely fine. And I decided, you know, the system is not fine. The system that I took advantage of, the system whereby somebody can take money, as I did, and raise millions of dollars in contributions, and be able to have working control over parts of our government is wrong. And I started thinking through the underlying principles of this and came to the realization, frankly, that whenever anybody wants something out of a public servant and they give that public servant something of value, financial value, that is a, a bribe. Now, if you say this inside the Beltway, people look at you like you're out of your mind. And by the way, most congressmen are fine people. 
Most staff are fine people, senators, fine people, people working in government, they are good people. They're not bad people. The people in politics aren't bad. There may be a few rotten eggs here and there, but no more than any other business. They are people, though, who believe that the system that we have is just fine. Now, we have a system, unfortunately, of legalized bribery. I'm sorry to say that. And I was at the tip of the spear of it, and I'm ashamed of that fact. And as a consequence, I went out to prison uh, after rethinking all these things. Frankly, I went to prison with the idea that I would go to prison, do my time, and then go away. Because, you know, I don't have the last name of Smith, so I can't exactly hide all the time. Sometimes I'll go to a store and hand over my credit card, and they'll look at it and go, oh, look, you must have a terrible time. You've got the name just like that guy from Washington. So I figured, all right, I'll change my name to Smith. I'll move to Montana. I'll hide somewhere. But in prison, while in prison, Congress passed a reform bill to fix the system. Well, like all of the reform bills they pass, it was ridiculous. Within 15 minutes of reading this bill, I came, I came up, I'm in prison in a prisoner's uniform, and I came up with 10 ways to get around their reform bill. And I decided, you know, maybe I shouldn't just go away. Maybe instead I should come out and, dis and try to help in the very effort and the very fight that I would have in the old days thought was insane. Maybe I should try to at least put the knowledge that I have to work in trying to help the very reform groups that attacked me and polluted me and, you know, spent their time attacking and doing what their job was with me. I wouldn't take it personally. I would just go and try to work with them, and I have. And some of these groups are working very hard. And folks, what we're trying to do is make Americans realize that we have immense dysfunction in Washington. David talked about it. The mayor talked about it. Everybody is going to talk about it tonight, and all of you are talking about it among yourselves. Well, part of that dysfunction is because our system has become one where there are flaws at the core. And one of the flaws is that people like I used to be can buy results, can buy results with money, and that is wrong. And so as a consequence, I, in a way of making recompense, in a way of trying to perhaps set a little bit right from my past, but in a way to be able to speak to people like you all and tell you, listen, I was in those smoke-filled rooms. I wasn't smoking, but I was in those smoke-filled rooms. I was behind those doors. I was making those deals. It is still going on. We need to have some action. We need our citizenry to rise up, not necessarily in March on Washington. That they laugh about, by the way. But the very thing, in fact, that was talked about earlier, the, the previous speaker, in fact, mentioning, get involved in the primaries and get involved and support people who are willing to actually take the difficult steps of reforming the system in this way. And so we, groups such as United Republic, such as Fund for, the, uh, uh, Fund for the Republic, we are working very hard to try to come up with legislation and try to come up with a way to repair what has happened in our country, what is something that I participated in. I'm ashamed and sorry I have to stand before you and tell you that today. I'd rather much come up and just uh, be able to make some jokes and talk about how horrible Washington is. Unfortunately, I can't. I've got to come and speak to you about an issue that unfortunately for me, I was involved in, and something which each of you can be involved in to fix. Don't let any of you think that, oh, I'm one citizen, I can't make a difference. All of you know better. All of you know that our country has a history of people, individuals who were nowhere getting involved and changing things at different ages, in different backgrounds, different educational levels. It doesn't matter. So I implore you to join wherever you feel appropriate. I'm not going to say everybody uh, meet down at the corner at 5 o'clock, but meet at whatever corner you're going to meet at and do whatever you can to recognize some of the problems that are going on in our country and do what you can to fix them. We live in a great country. And I say that, by the way, as somebody who is in one of our federal prisons for 1,299 nights. And in that prison, unfortunately, every one of those other men almost hate our country, resent our country, and don't appreciate our country. Well, they've been through difficult circumstances. Unfortunately, they've had difficult lives in many respects, and they all have their stories. But my story is one to understand. It was I who did what I did, 
and it is I who am going to try to do what I can to join all of you, I hope, and to fix it. God bless you. Thanks for having me here tonight.